Start. What's up, world? Welcome back to Finnegan's Garage. Thank you for hanging out for me. Look, it's the rubber duck. Today's update day. A lot going on. Um, just got back from drag week. Just got back from a roadkill shoot. Just got back from an episode of Faster with Finnegan, which actually I didn't get back from that at all. It happened here in the garage, which is why it looks like a bomb went off in here. And... Um, Sadly, the rubber duck didn't get finished in time for that episode of Fast with Finnegan, which just means off camera when the camera crew is not here, I need to get back to work on this thing to make it run so that we can film with it again. Because our next outing with this car will be at a drag strip. And uh, as you can see, she looks very similar from here, but from over here, she is wildly different because she has a new stance. She has new rear suspension. Sits quite a bit lower, which makes me happy. Um, but a byproduct of all that is the fact that she no longer has a floor. And uh, that drive shaft's probably not gonna work out too well either. <laughs> so, uh, a lot of work left to do there. But that's not a bad thing, because we like hard work here at Finnegan's Garage. Uh, in the meantime, let's keep walking around. Uh, welding room, that's not gonna change. Needs to be cleaned up a little bit, but that's not gonna change. My Eastwood mini lathe, definitely gonna move it out of here. Definitely gonna put it on top of a real bench top because the uh, rolling cart that I've got it sitting on is not cutting it, it moves around way too much. This room, which was where my neighbor used to hang out, and watch TV and I think polishes Harley and whatnot. This room has just kind of become a catch-all. We've got the Wirenator 3000 there, which is spit wires all over the floor, um, tube bender, crimping machine for hoses, bead roller. It's all just kind of hanging out in here because we're not actively using those tools. Um, oh yeah, and I, I said we, but there's no more we. So let's talk about that. Uh, you're gonna notice the videos kind of look and feel a little different going forward. Probably more back towards what you were used to at the very beginning uh, of this channel, and that's because David Newburn is no longer with us. He has left, he has quit, he is basically going home to his family. Um, he took a lot of hours into making this channel great, and like me, he's got like seven jobs, and uh, he needed to get rid of one of those jobs so he could actually be home with his family. And so I'm very excited for him to make that decision. Um, not upset at all about it because it was the right decision. And I don't know exactly what he's gonna be doing. I don't know if he's going to start his own YouTube channel or, or what. Um, I believe he'll still continue to do Faster with Finnegan because um, I think that's kind of a limited amount of time that he puts into that. And maybe that doesn't eat up as much as Finnegan's Garage did for him. So hopefully he continues doing that, but he won't be on this channel anymore and he won't be working for me every day, which is unfortunate. But again, like I said, right decision for him. So I totally understand it. I know I said I want to work on the shop a little bit and clean it up and try to make it a little more breathable. But uh, what I really need to do today is get Blasphemia off the back of the OG because it hasn't moved since Drag Week. And the OG needs a bit of work done to it. It's leaking out of multiple orifices. And uh, Blasphemy needs some work done to it. Let's see, the last time you guys saw it, we got rained out at Drag Week. But little did you know, on the way home from Drag Week, I stopped at Beach Bend in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and I did make a pass, A to B, with all the smoke still in the engine. And uh, you'll see that in an upcoming video. But uh, I'm gonna get it ready to go back to Pete Harrell's to chassis dyno it again because we found out some really interesting information when uh, it was on his chassis dyno the last time and when I took it down the drag strip and melted it. Um, turns out the fuel cell was not empty. And although it was really low on fuel, that was not our problem. As it turns out, uh, didn't have enough fuel pump 
in the tank for the new engine combo. And so on my way home from drag week, I stopped in Bowling Green, Kentucky, got a new Holly VR series brushless pump, temporarily wired it and plumbed it into that tank, and then went out and made a rip A to B, and the mile an hour bet was back up, the engine was happy, and uh, the smoke was, like I said, the smoke stayed in the engine. So we're gonna get the car off here, kind of give it an autopsy in the garage here, and then uh, drop the ramp truck off at my favorite local mechanic shop to have uh, some of the leaks fixed. So here we go. What do you think, Bo? Like the rubber duck? Oh yeah, you do. You wanna go for a ride? I was like, hell yeah, I wanna go for a ride, but you got no seat. I know. You're like, there's no seat, brother. Where am I gonna ride? How am I gonna ride in this hunk of junk when there's no seat in it? I honestly thought Bo would jump right in there because no seat is better than these hard plastic seats. Here's a table full of parts that never got installed. We've got an applied racing technologies anti-roll bar. Uh, dry shaft safety loop got cut out because it was in the way. Those are ladder bar mounting brackets for the new quick performance rear end that didn't get used. So I need to mount that. I need to make probably one, maybe even two drive shaft safety loops. And, uh, and then I need to take this drive shaft to the drive shaft shop and say, hey, we cut this in half because it was too short and extended it. We need one this long. But first, let's clean the shop. I can't work in a dirty shop. If you've ever met me in person or worked with me, you know Dirty Shop drives me insane and I find it hard to focus. So here's time-lapse footage of me cleaning the entire shop in like 30 seconds flat because YouTube. We unload blasphemy because I need to put blasphemy back in the garage so I can permanently install those fuel pumps and do a bunch of other things that the car needs before the next time we go chassis dyno it and then track test it because she's good but not great. We need her to be great. Let me show you how we do this. So, this is your basic garden variety load a 55 Chevy Hemi powered gasser onto a square body ramp truck kit. Yeah, she fits good. Tires are a little tight someday. Yeah, the tires are pretty much touching a cross member under there. So someday this thing needs airbags or the bed needs to get redesigned. Simply put, I've restored this truck and it's fairly useless because you really can't put anything on the back of it without the tires rubbing. You know, and truth be told, this truck was built around 16 inch tires. We now have 19 fives because they're safer. They have a way higher load carrying capability than the old 16s did, but they're also bigger in diameter. These tires are nearly 32 inches in diameter, whereas the old 16s were about a 30. And so we don't have a lot of clearance under there. So over the winter, this thing really needs airbags. Um, I wouldn't mind redesigning the back half of it for axle clearance and you know ramp storage and some other things. But right now, let's just get the car off, shall we? So we got four attachment points. And I'm usually in a hurry when I load this thing, so I just stuff the excess into the compartments, which is not the right way to do it. These end up flapping on the paint, but the paint's hammered anyway. So not really worried about the paint job on the ramp bed. I use short axle straps around the cross members of the car to attach the hooks to. Uh, these are not great tie straps. You know, they ratchet, which is good, but the ends are open. So if your load ever comes loose and these move around, these tend to come undone. So these are not a good long-term solution. Axle straps, good open-ended tie straps like this one, not good, not good at all. So. If you're gonna do this, get some good quality ones. Don't be like me, get like uh, max tie downs. Those things are very nice. There's a bunch of really nice ones out there that clip on the end so that they can't fall off. That's what you want. It's like I always say, if you know the rules, you can break them. Just pre be prepared for, 
you know, suffering the consequences when it goes wrong. And you'll notice I'm doing this backwards. I'm unstrapping the thing before I even have the ramps out. And that's because the video camera's on this side. And also because I still have the winch hooked up up front. I still have straps on the other side hooked up. I'm really not worried about the car falling off. But if it does, well, you're here, the camera's here. It won't be boring. But it's probably not going to fall off. That's what I'm telling myself. So I was going to show you my hammer that I keep in the corner compartment that I use to knock out these aluminum pins that I made. And these pins slide in the back of the ramps and go through the bed to hold them in place while you're transporting the vehicle. Except when I open the compartment to get the hammer out, I found the pins. That means two things. Either I was going to unload this earlier, pulled the pins and then just stopped working and forgot that I put them away. Or I drove all the way from Bowling Green, Kentucky to Georgia without the pins in the back. And the only thing holding the ramps on there were hopes and dreams. I'm going to go with, I probably just started unloading here at home, forgot and got distracted and, you know, took my kids to school or something. Yeah, that's it. Definitely didn't drive a couple hundred miles with the ramps unsecured. So I'm going to unload these now, and then I'm probably going to go buy a lottery ticket. If you look close there, you can see about 97 drip marks, which I don't understand. How could it be leaking from that many places? I don't have time to find out myself. I'll be dropping it off at my buddy's mechanic spot to get it fixed. While I work on blasting, part of the reason I own more than one ramp truck and uh, more than one project vehicle, you know, yes, it's because I'm crazy and my eyes are bigger than my wallet, my stomach and everything else. And I want all the vehicles. <laughs> But the other part of it was, when Newbern was here working full time, we had time to work on all these things together. And when I was off filming Roadkill, he had time to continue working. And if we went to events, we could take two ramp trucks. It was rad. But uh, now that he's gone, I'm not going to keep two ramp trucks. Um, and some of these other project cars that we haven't even started on, you know, I'm not going to get to because I'm by myself. So probably going to get rid of some vehicles, probably going to thin the herd. Every now and again, you just gotta purge things, you know? And sometimes that decision gets made for you. Ah, oh, it's beautiful in Georgia. This is one of my favorite times of the year because it's not really humid. The sky is blue. Hemis are running right like they should. All around good time of the year for a bird to poop on my car. Can you believe that? A bird crapped on my fresh, flat black paint with my non body gap having misaligned sheet metal by sheet metal I mean fiberglass before I can start it up and pull it in the garage I got to pull off all the, the rain guard this is for our trip home I got that good gorilla 200 mile an hour tape which is far superior to the 100 mile an hour duct tape Ask anyone, they'll tell you. Ask any real racer. Okay, let's see if it still runs, shall we? Oh man, I'm so happy to have this car back and running again. You don't even know. This car makes me so happy. All right, ignition. I have two battery disconnects. I have one here and then I have one in the back. And uh, this one allows me to shut off the car. The one in the back allows a safety crew to shut off the car in case, uh, you know, I'm incapacitated. Okay, ignition, start.
<laughs> oh, I love this car. All right. Now that she's safely back in the garage, I'm gonna go drop the ramp truck off, then I'm gonna come back and we're gonna permanently install our fuel pumps and our fuel pump controllers. I'll teach you all kinds of cool stuff about that. Trust me. I should have backed the car in here because the lighting would have been better, but that's all right. Okay. Still need to pack the parachute. We'll do that later. For now, we'll just toss it under the car. And uh, this big black case is the spare third member that Caleb from Quick Performance brought to Hot Rod Drag Week, only to find out we didn't need a third member at all. However, I am going to test it because we have four 30s in the car, and the one and only pass I made after Drag Week, we went through the lights at like 7,400 RPM, and that was with me granny shifting during the entire pass, which means... But if I don't granny shift and I get into fourth gear sooner, we're going to be going through the traps probably at 7,600, uh, which is probably right past the peak of where this motor likes to rev. And so probably going to take the 430s out and put this in, which I think is a 410 or a 411, and try testing with this because this may be better suited to what I'm doing. Um, the old setup in this car was a 325 rear gear but that was with the other transmission. We used to have a G-Force GF5R five-speed in this, and it had a 325 first gear. This one has, I think, a 279 first gear. It's, it's wildly different ratios in this transmission. And um, it drives good on the street. It drives really good on the highway. We just need to get our final drive ratio, you know, and our starting line ratio where the car is happy. And uh, I think this might be a good swap to make. But uh, we'll do this later. My goal is to get the car ready to go back to the chassis dyno at Harrell Engine and Dyno in Mooresville and re-dyno it and retune it now that we have enough fuel pump in the car. And um, because I'm pretty sure the tune that's in it is not optimum for you know the fuel pressure we now have that is stable. Um, I'll show you that here in a minute. Um, I'll give you a look of the data log of what a stable fuel pressure throughout a run looks like, and then I'll show you what happened during drag week on my one and only pass where I melted the motor down. All right, so look in here. There's normally two trap doors in here, one here and one here. Under this trap door is a Holly fuel pump that is not brushless, doesn't require a controller. That is for pump gas. There's a 16 gallon fuel cell hidden under the floor here that is filled through the factory filler door in the quarter panel. 55 Chevy, you can do that. 56 Chevy, fuel filler is through the taillight. And so that's an easy way to tell the two cars apart is 55 has a fuel door in the driver's side quarter panel, 56 does not. Anyway, this trap door, which is not on here, this is where the five gallon race cell lives. And there's a Holly now brushless pair of fuel pumps in here with two controllers. And you'll see they're just kind of shoddily zip tired and wired in there. That's because I replaced the non brushless pumps. There were two 450s in here in this module with these two brushless pumps that are built into this module that just drops in. And then I just quickly wired them into the Holly Dominator ECU they're wired up staggered, so one is on at idle, and the moment this thing sees about 30% throttle position, the other pump turns on. And so anyway, today's goal is to rewire, remount, clean this up so the door can go back on, and also so that this stuff isn't just hanging out in the trunk like that. Uh, one, it's you know not safe, it's kind of a fire hazard, and two, streetcar. This is where my luggage goes, this is where, you know, all the stuff goes when we're driving between track to track and uh, doing drag and drive events, you know, or at least when we used to, you know, when we finished those things. <laughs> uh, that's the goal for the next one. Uh, finish. Start the event, make a pass every day, finish the event. That's the next goal. So, all right, let me get some wire cutters. We'll cut all this out. We've got some holes already here from some other stuff that was there over the years. We'll probably try to reuse these holes and mount these two controllers right there. Because um, although they're, they're housed in heavy-duty aluminum cases, I I'd rather keep them out of the elements than stick them under the car. 
Okie dokie. Got our controllers unzip tied from the wire harness back here. This wire harness here is simply the tail light wiring of the car. And also it was the old wires that came from the relays in the car to the old fuel pumps. Now both fuel pumps are installed in the same manner. This is a Holly fuel cell module. This is meant to replace the cap of a fuel cell. They come in six, 10 and 12 bolt mounts. Essentially, if you have a fuel cell, you can just take your cap off, bolt this in, make some adjustments to the pickup, add some wires, and you can drop in as much as 2000 horsepower worth of fuel pump. My issue was I had the non-brushless version of that module in there. And because I was running E85 fuel, and because we had a rich tune-up in this motor, and because this motor is hungry, that was not nearly enough fuel pump. So after drag week, I stopped at Bowling Green, Kentucky, got the brushless version of this module, quickly zip tied the, the controllers into the car here, just ran the wires real quick, made one hit, discovered everything was now fine. We have plenty of fuel pump. We need to go back to the chassis dyno, but before I do that, I wanna mount these better, reroute the wires, improve the connections, and then put the panel back on here to seal the fumes from the cell from the passenger compartment. So that's today's goal. The way these work are this connector right here, looks like a weather pack style connector. This is the input side. This will get power, this will get ground, this will get a trigger. Uh, it also has a yellow wire that can control the speed of this. If you ground that yellow wire, it will tell the module to run the fuel pump at half speed, which is great when you're just idling around town. You don't need the fuel pump running at max speed the whole time because that just puts heat into the fuel. If you don't ground the yellow wire, pump is on 100%. So the way this works is the Holly Dominator ECU triggers a relay, the relay sends power to this, this turns on the fuel pump. So I have one for just idling, and then I have another one that turns on at about 30% throttle position for when the engine sees boost. And the Dominator will tell the second one to turn on, like I said, at 30% throttle position, and then we have all kinds of fuel. These are going to mount right about here, and I think that I have a big enough grommet in here that I can take the fuel pump wires with the Deutsch connectors on them and shove them up through the floor, rewire this all nice, and, uh, and we'll be good to go. So, I don't want to cut up the grommet to shove this through here, and obviously once you get one through, the second one might not want to go through. So we're going to unpin these Deutsch connectors. Now they are numbered on the back, which is nice. And what you want to do before you unpin it is write down the number and the color code of the wires so you know how to put it back together afterwards. So there's one, two, three, four. And looking at here, it goes green and white, and then it goes red and black, one and two. So on this particular one, oh, hi, Bell. Hi, Bell. As you can just take needle nose pliers and grab onto the wedge block. Wow, that isn't there good. There we go. So see, I've just grabbed it with needle nose. On the four pin, you can use a needle nose here. On some of the other ones, you have to use a screwdriver or a pick, but that does come out pretty easily. And then what you wanna do is take a small screwdriver, lift the little retaining tab there up, and then you can gently pull the wire out. So for instance, I'm gonna go like that. Once I do that, I can pull the green wire out. There's one. So now that that's out, we can put these carefully through the grommet and then on the other side of the floor we can reinstall the connector. So here's our four wires. Here's the pieces of our Deutsch connector. There's our wiring schematic. One, one, two, two, three, four. You'll hear them click when they're all the way in. And then 
Just give them a slight tug so you know they're installed properly. Put the wedge lock back in, and boom. Deutsche connector reassembled, and it'll plug right into the controller right here. One down, one to go. Here are the fuel pump controllers. We've got our wires from our fuel pumps waiting right here with our Deutsche connectors installed. Uh, if you know anything about me, or if you've been a fan of this channel for a while, you probably know I don't like drilling a lot of extra holes and things, especially in a boat or in a car I care about. However, there's already one, two, three, four, five, six holes in here, four of which were from one of these brushless controllers I ran years ago when I only had one fuel pump in here instead of two. So I'm not really worried about adding more. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use half the holes from that old brushless controller mount for one and the other half for the other one. And then you can see I've used a silver Sharpie here and here to mark out the other bolt pattern. This will cover up one extra hole. We'll have one random here when we're done, but you know, it is what it is. But what I wanna show you guys after I mark these holes and drill these holes is a nifty way to mount things in sheet metal when you don't have the luxury of through bolting it or you don't have the luxury of a second pair of hands to help you hold the nut on the backside. we're done drilling, let me show you this. This is called a nut cert, a thread cert, a lot of different names for it, a lot of different places you can buy it. You can get these at good hardware stores, you can get these at McMasterCar.com, you can get these off Amazon. And what they are is a threaded insert that a bolt will go into, and once it's in there, when you install it, the tool is gonna to expand the insert behind the sheet metal so that it can't pop back out under normal circumstances. And the way it does that is you thread the insert on the tool, install the insert into the hole you just drilled, squeeze the tool, and the force of it getting squeezed right there is gonna expand the bottom half of this behind the hole, and then you just have a threaded hole that you can put your bolt into. the lights in the shop and uh, make viewing my laptop a little easier and show you guys exactly what went on when we melted down the engine at Hot Rod Drag Week and how we fixed it. Ooh, this is spooky. All right. And I'm going to open the Holly EFI data log Drag Week. Test and tune pass. And let's get rid of some things here. All right. So all you're looking at right now the green line is throttle position. Whoops, touch screen got me. Red line is engine RPM. All right, so what you're seeing here in the dips are gear changes. And this is the first time I've made a rip in this car. After two years, this is with a new transmission, going from a five speed to a six speed, new rear end gears, new engine, basically a new car. So I'm granny shifting it. So you can see the 
leaves the starting line without the two-step, and I short shift first gear at about 6,100 RPM. And here's the gear change. You can see the engine RPM drop. Throttle positioning green drops all the way down to zero. Engine RPM drops. Then I get back in it. Second gear, engine RPM drops. Third gear, way out here, fourth gear, right? And the engine makes peak power, I'm guessing, at about 7,300. I wasn't there on the dyno, but they revved it to 7,000 and said it was still climbing. So first gear, I short shift. But second gear, I run out to 6,700. Third gear, I run out just above 7,000. Then I click it into fourth, and it's pulling, but it's not pulling great. Okay, And here's why. I'm now going to turn on fuel pressure. That's the blue line, right? So here we go. This is why everything went wrong on day one of Drag Week. Our base fuel pressure is set at 61 PSI. That's where we're at, right here where the cursor is for the whole shot. At the top of first gear, you'll see the blue line is dipping down. When I make the gear change, it's down to 36 PSI. As a result of that, our injector duty cycle is right here. It's at 53% already. We make the gear change, the fuel comes back up to 76. So it starts out at 60, but the engine's making about 15 pounds of boost, and for every pound of boost, the fuel pressure should climb one pound, and it does. It's up here at 76 in second gear. Things are going good. Engine RPM is climbing. Everything's good until I make the gear change. And here's the granny shift. You can see throttle position comes all the way down. When I make the gear change, the fuel pressure drops to 14. I click it into gear. It starts coming back up, but the engine's making boost, but it doesn't have enough fuel pressure here. And it gets to 65 right at the very beginning of third gear and then nose dives and never really recovers. Through most of third gear, we're down here at 15 pounds of fuel pressure. As a result, our injector duty cycle is 84%. It is through the roof. The injectors are trying to maintain our target air fuel ratio, but they don't have fuel pressure to do the job. So here's the last gear change. We click it into fourth, fuel pressure climbs, to 27 PSI, which is not enough for all the boost we're running. And then it just dies. 16 PSI through the rest of the run. Now, I thought this was all because there wasn't enough fuel in the tank. But what actually happened, and I'm going to turn off everything but fuel pressure. So there's our fuel pressure through our run. What actually happened, and I'm going to open a comparison data log, is I ran out of fuel pump. The dotted line is the day after drag week when I took out our non-brushless fuel pumps from the fuel cell and installed a higher power brushless pair of fuel pumps in that fuel cell. Leaves the starting line, gear change, we are good. Fuel pressure, rock solid throughout the run. Dips with the gear change because they're not making boost when I'm granny shifting it but is right back up where it needs to be, 78 PSI throughout the entire run. Had I gone after drag week and made another hit after we rebuilt the motor with the same fuel pumps, I'd have melted the motor down again. That right there, friends, is the value of a data logger. That's something you don't easily figure out from the seat of your pants until it's too late. And yes, we now have safeties turned on once again in the ECU so that if we ever lose fuel pressure again like we did during the drag week pass, that doesn't happen again. The engine doesn't melt itself down again. That's why I put in new fuel pumps. It's dark in here, so I can't see how to unzoom this again. <laughs> but anyway, there's your answer. Fuel system is done. Car is ready to go back on the street. The thing I need to do before driving it really long distances is take that drive shaft back out, uh, replace the yoke that got mangled during drag week when the U joint fell apart, just to make sure we're not gonna have any future problems there. And then I have a long list of to-dos before we hit our next Dragon Drive event. Um, the first thing is, this thing needs a mid-plate because the engine is moving over an inch. If you guys remember the dyno video from a few episodes ago, you could see the engine torquing over. The two front motor plates weren't locking it totally in place. And so, gonna install a mid-plate. Uh, fuel pump wiring is done, obviously. We're gonna finish our trans tunnel and then install our carpet. Drive shaft will get replaced. We're going to test a new third member and then 
It's just little things, little niceties that'll make this thing even more streetable. And then we go back to a drag and drive event and shoot for some eight second passes. More importantly, finishing a drag and drive event. Thanks for watching Finnegan's Garage. I appreciate every single one of you, especially the ones that went to fsmgarage.com and bought the merch. Every one of those hoodies and t-shirts you bought with Blast Me on them, well, that money went right back into the crankcase, let's be real. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I'll see you all real soon. <laughs>